Hi, I'm Time staff writer Reza Bruner, and I'm joined today by actor, producer, and humanitarian Kate Blanchett and producer Stacy Share. Thank you so much both for being here today. So, mm -hmm. Stacy and Kate, you work together on the Hulu miniseries Mrs. America, which came out last spring. The show brings to life the very fraught politics of the 1970s and some of its most vocal activists. And Kate, you played Phyllis Schlafly, who is a very complicated figure who successfully combated the ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment. What did you learn from sharing that story and how has that impacted you today? Just how terrifying and polarizing uh, the, uh, any sort of civil discussion around the notion of equality is in the in America, mm -hmm. and I'm much to my shame when Stacy and I first started speaking about the project, I was not aware that the American Constitution didn't accept um, the and um, the notion that one couldn't discriminate on the basis of of, of sex of, of, of gender. So the whole whole process of making Mrs. America was a learning curve. But I think where I wanted to lean in was that I, I, women are not a monolith. And I think that's something that the series really deals with. And so that means dealing with second wave feminism and the process of wanting to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment and including as many voices as possible. And that includes <laughs> Phyllis Schlafly. So it was a process for me of having to set my own worldview and politics aside I'm, I'm for um, not for black and white um, examination of anything I'm for nuance which I think is the polar opposite of what where Phyllis how she looks at the world so it was um, quite difficult but uh, I think I found it um, a huge hugely um, educative and Stacey you have an incredible resume as a producer you worked on all kinds of projects from Pulp Fiction to Aaron Brockovich Reno 911 and then this what did you want why did you want to add mrs america to that list what was so important and compelling to you about this story kate always likes to say that because she grew up in australia she always identified as a feminist i grew up in a kind of backlashy america where it became the f word and i became a feminist really and and comfortable with saying that in the 90s and i was interested in looking at the backlash to the women's movement. And at the time we began, it was really in the lead up to the 2016 election. And when Donald Trump was elected, the story really became the story of how we got here from there. So I, I, I mean, that's really has, has been my enduring interest in it. And, and to, if you don't understand Phyllis Schlafly, you don't understand how we have Amy Conant Connie Barrett, you know? It's interesting because the show came out almost a whole year ago. And in some ways it feels like everything has changed since then, but also in some ways nothing has changed. So what do you think the legacy of this show has been over the past year? What have you taken away from the experience and the conversation that it sparked? Um, Kate? Um well, I, I think what has been revealed by the pandemic, if, if we didn't already know it, is that, that, that we're all, and it's not just America, it's globally, we're dealing with systemic inequality. And it's not just gender inequality, it's economic inequality, societal economic inequality, cultural inequality. And all roads lead to Rome in terms of, I mean, if your constitution doesn't ratify the notion of equality, how can anything that proceeds um, be approach equal and I, I I on a daily basis I, I and I found this you know from people that have seen the series um, and perhaps come late to it it's just every day and this is our experience on set as as well is that we, we think that certain things may have been committed in sitting in aspect back in the 70s or, or early 80s, but yet something would happen. We'd read something in the New York Times or the Huffington Post or wherever or on, on a conservative blogger's website where the bathroom debate was coming up yet again. It's, it, it, it continues to reveal itself. And I think because we, we think because we've made a lot of so-called technical uh, technological progress that we've made societal progress, and I just think we're, we're realising that we really haven't moved that far. I mean, the people, a, a big quadrant of, of um, society that's really suffering um, are mothers in the pandemic, because still the division of labor at, at home is unequal. 
And so I think that a lot of people have been reflecting on how did we get here? which is of course what motivated us, you know, reeling from the results of the 2016 election. And, and of course, race is an incredible issue in, in America that must be addressed, but also the misogyny <clears throat> that was just rampant and it has been rampant over the last four years and gone unchecked and, and undealt with. I think people are, are, are wanting to approach um, story as a place to have a non-polarizing inclusive discussion about that. And I do think that that is something that, that story can do. I mean, we had such an extraordinary cast. And so we came at the, the notion of the Equal Rights Amendment um, from many, many different angles. I think it's got a lot of in entry points for a broad audience. Absolutely. And so, you mentioned the importance of these different stories that we're starting to tell and bringing more inclusive projects and voices to the screen. Stacy, as a producer, you can see better than most the direction that Hollywood is headed. Um, what do you want to see more of? And do you feel like there is change happening in that environment? Do you have a mission or a plan in terms of the types of things that you want to attach yourself to going forward? Absolutely. I mean, look, I'm so happy that we were able to begin to shine a light on Shirley Chisholm and her extraordinary accomplishments. I, I think we're starting to see it. I was just completely captivated by Nomadland and to see Chloe Zhao's poetic and beautiful eye trained on, on American life. Um, it, it, it was transformative and transporting. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Insecure. I love being in Issa Rae's worldview. When you look at like director Bong Joon-ho and Parasite and last year, you know, running the tables in the Oscars, I think what we're getting is the freshness and the renewal of voice in our industry comes from different voices and seeing the world through different eyes. In the same way that when I saw Midnight Cowboy, I didn't know anybody like Razzo Rizzo and Joe Buck. I'm now like totally dating myself, but um, to give you a super old movie. But um, I, I was able to experience the singularity of their humanity and the commonality of our life experiences. And that's what's so exciting about intersectional storytelling. We get to go to different places, and that's what storytelling is about, for me at least. Absolutely. But I think, too, that, that Hollywood is a, a bit of a, a nostalgic concept, and I, I think that there's so many ways that you can you can view stories now that it's, it, you don't necessarily, because form is content in a lot of ways. Sorry to sound sort of like an advertising slogan, but, uh, you know, <laughs> that when you can find different forms and, and you, can, you can make, uh, find the right place and size and space that um, you can you can find different audiences and those audiences will will shift the horrible algorithms you know that we've, mm. we've been force fed for so many years well both of you though have made notable efforts continually over the decades to you know be part of stories that are led by complicated female figures kate you especially have taken on such a variety of different roles of you know, figures that aren't always super likable, um, but have a powerful story to tell. So why has that been something you've been drawn to? Um, I, I think, I mean, it's, it's sort of a, it's an act of sort of, it's active anthropology for me, you know, the whole process of uncovering stuff, no matter what genre you're in. You know, if, you, if you're doing an action film, like I, you know, then you can, you can the, the myriad of action films that you can watch, you suddenly learn so much about that genre. And I think, the same is often said um, for, for women who have lived interesting lives. I think when I was starting out in my career, what used to happen, though, is that they were incredibly complicated women in very reductive narratives. And so the process was ultimately incredibly frustrating, hence the notion of the, the pejorative term biopic, because it is not simply enough to have um, an interesting life. There are millions of women who have, and I would rather read a book about it. But what happens is that if, you know, when I was first starting out, is, the, is you might make a, um, a story, a film about an interesting woman, but the narrative would, you know, just be the same story rehashed, or it wouldn't have a chance to be marketed and seen. 
And so therefore it compounded this, this idea that, that stories with women at the center didn't make any money or no one was interested in seeing them. And I think the wonderful thing, I mean, you know, there's positives and negatives about this so-called streaming rev revolution, but the positive thing is that there is a, a, a myriad of voices out, out there now and a myriad of, of ways of consuming those stories. And so, I mean, most of to, to what Stacey was saying about some of her um, favorite films this year or, or, or screen experiences, the majority of mine are by women. Now that's not just because I'm looking for them, that's just because they're there. You know, you can see a, a, broader, a broader audience gets to see Kelly Reichardt's first cow or that incredible um, uh, Garrett Bradley's documentary Time. You know, look, oh. all of those things that you can, you can see which show, speak to um, experiences outside your own. And so I find that so uh, exciting. So since we're talking about movies this year and we're in the middle of award season, I want to go there. <laughs> Stacey, you are involved in the production of the upcoming Oscars. Award shows have been the subject of a lot of conversation lately. You know, do you think that some of the criticisms are appropriate? Um, and how can we as audiences find new meaning or connect in new ways with these shows? Well, I'm not going to throw rocks at anybody else um, since, you know, that's a setup for me um, at this moment in time. Look, it's very challenging, but I think that like everything that we're seeing in our society that needs to be shook up a little bit, now's the time to do it when the rules that apply to everything cannot apply because of the pandemic and for the need for change, for deep change. So I, I think you return, I, I'm very romantic about the notion of storytelling and its ability to um, provide meaning and community in our lives. And I think that that's the thing that we have to um, lean into. Look, we are, there are a lot of things that are said about Hollywood, right? But we are a union business that figured out how to get our mostly um, blue collar um, crews into back to work safely with less than a 1% infection rate. And we take care of our own this year, the Oscars are honoring with the Hirschholt award, the motion picture television fund and those heroic frontline workers in the nursing home at the, at the, at the home in, in Woodland Hills. So I think, you know, you have to, we, we haven't done a very good job, ironically telling our own story because it becomes reduced down to what are you wearing? And um, as opposed to what are you, how do you want people to see? And how do you want to transform people's lives through these incredible empathy machines that are cinemas? Yeah. And Kate, are you encouraged by changes that have been made in the industry and the types of projects that are cropping up this year or that are on your plate going forward? Yes, I mean, there's almost too much being made in, a, in some in some respects. It's sort of you you have the, that sense that you can't possibly watch watch everything, which is exciting on 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 one level. But definitely, I mean, I you know when we were just talking about it earlier, Stacey and I were saying that you know when we sat down to make a list of directors that we wanted to work with. Uh, just out of our mouths poured a, a whole raft of female directors that we wanted to work with and you know it was scores without even thinking about it and I don't think that that is a conversation that we would have felt confident in taking towards uh well a streaming platform or, or then a studio and knowing that we could get them approved and it's now it's just a no-brainer but it's also unlike Phyllis Schlafly who was very very happy being the only woman in the room I don't think any of us want to be the only woman in the room, and so I think that there's a real there's a real sense of um, uh, there's a real collegiate spirit, and I'm not just amongst women, amongst men, because I think when you walk onto set and you're the only woman, and there's 35 men in front of you, the conversation, the jokes, the the outcome will always be the same, and we're a creative industry that thrives on um, like a, a on exciting sort of restless churn of ideas and when those when those ideas have a lot of different come from a lot of different perspectives the outcome will be much more exciting so i i i'm i think it's an incredibly exciting time to um to be emerging into an industry like this because it's full of possibilities i think well on that very uplifting and optimistic note 
people in this conversation. Kate, Stacey, thank you so much for joining mm -hmm. us for the Time Voices of the Future Women's Summit. It's been a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you.